Hi, I'm Irene Gooch, founder of Loving Lessons, and I'm here. We're talking about moms mattering. This month is May, and it is Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month. And I have some special guests that are here to share some information that are going to help moms everywhere, um, especially during this fourth trimester, um, right after having babies. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome all my guests. Thank you for being here with me tonight. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. Jennifer, go ahead, tell us who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, my name is Jennifer Silliman. I'm actually co-producer of a documentary film that's going to be released hopefully in the fall titled Dark Side of the Full Moon. And it is um, basically a documentary that's going to show two moms on their journey to find answers as to why they went through what they went through and could not find the help that they needed while they were going through it. So it's going to be a very interesting documentary. Um, I'm also a PSI coordinator. Um, I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator um, for PSI. And I started Moms to Moms South Florida locally um, so mothers could have a support group to go to if they were battling with some sort of um, maternal mental health um, illness. Jennifer, what is PSI? PSI is Postpartum Support International. Right. It is um, the largest and only organization that deals specifically with perinatal mood disorders. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Evelyn Bussell. I am a mother of a rambunctious toddler. Mm -hmm. I am a survivor of postpartum depression, anxiety, and OCD. And I am also a birth doula and childbirth educator. Great. Thank you. And I'm Chris Rains, and I work at the UNC Perinatal Mood Disorder Clinic. I'm a dual trained nurse practitioner in women's health and psychiatry um, and help to um, establish our program at UNC and establish our inpatient perinatal psychiatric unit. Great. Well, thank you, ladies, for being here. And, you know, one of the things that's really important, why I, I even like lo love having guests like you here with me. Is because as a sleep coach, a lot of times I'm working with moms who are really tired and their babies are not sleeping and they're not sleeping. And all of a sudden, you know, they really want to make sleep work and sometimes they choose to sleep train or sleep coach their baby and it doesn't end up working. And one of the big things that sometimes will happen is that there is maybe postpartum depression or some kind of perinatal mood disorder taking place. So you know, sometimes that holds them back from feeling that bond and success with their child and getting that good sleep that they need. So what can you tell me as far as like symptoms? What are things that you notice for moms during this fourth trimester? Well, and Irene, this is Chris, and I think um, what you talk about is very important because when we look at presenting symptoms of women, the majority of the time we see them present with either anxiety or insomnia. Um, and so difficulty with sleeping with a newborn baby um, is difficult in normal circumstances. Um, but when you have a mom that has some anxiety or there may be something else going on or doesn't have the support she needs, that lack of sleep can really be a trigger um, to a more serious problem. Yeah, so when I was going through um, my bout with uh, perinatal mood disorders, I had a hard time going to sleep. I, um, in the beginning, I could not sleep if I could hear my baby, and then I couldn't sleep if I couldn't hear her. And once I got past that hurdle, I had a hard time going to sleep or staying asleep because I had intrusive thoughts and ruminations, and that's another symptom of just um, thoughts that come into your head that may not be necessarily normal. Um, they might be scary thoughts of things happening either to you as the mom or things happening to your baby um, that most likely are not going to happen, but they're intrusive, so they just keep coming and coming, um, and you can't turn them off. Um, another sometime would be uh, not wanting to leave the house or not wanting to be around other people because you're afraid that they might see uh, that you're a bad mom, that you're not doing as well as everybody thinks you should be doing or that you have in your mind, um, which obviously is not the case, but that would be um, some other symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I had pregnancy and postpartum um, OCD with intrusive thoughts, very similar to Evelyn, actually. And ironically, I was able to sleep, which is not common. Now, when I'm running support groups, I hear a lot of them go, well, you can sleep. And the sleep was actually the only time that I didn't have intrusive thoughts. So I didn't have nightmares. I didn't have anything. I actually slept fairly well, but the minute I woke up, I was in that place again for as long as I was awake. So I actually tried to sleep as much as I could because that was the only time where my mind was at peace. Um, otherwise, it was filled with lots of scary thoughts that didn't make any sense to me. They made you kind of feel like you're going crazy because you don't know. And, and, I, and I think the biggest thing with symptoms is that a lot of childbirth educators and everyone, we talk about the symptoms, but also we don't talk about the risk factors. And when I found out about the risk factors through a, through a book, <laughs> it wasn't through a physician, it was through a book, I was like, my goodness, I had three of them. I mean, I was totally set up probably to have this happen to me, and nobody told me. And so it was that was more upsetting to me than anything because you know they, they tell you the risk factors for everything else that might happen if you're over a certain age you have to do this test if um you know you get the the, the sequence of gestational diabetes and you get all these screenings and testing and all that which are great but going into it I had three risk factors and nobody and told me so I think Jennifer brings up a really good point um. And from, from a provider standpoint, our OBGYNs and our family practice docs and our pediatricians are not trained real well in picking up the symptoms of um, perinatal mood disorder. And we tend to not call it depression because a lot of women don't present with depression and they think, well, I'm really just anxious, I'm not depressed. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting with both Evelyn and um, Jennifer that you can see that the symptoms are or a wide range and they differ so from mom to mom they differ so being able to look at how you're feeling after you deliver sleeplessness is going to be hard anyway because you have a newborn baby mm -hmm. um, but if those things last longer than two weeks which is our kind of criteria um, for any type of um, anxiety or issues happening after two weeks a lot of women will know what's going on before that but we know that one in seven women um, will suffer from some form of postpartum mood disorder, whether it's anxiety, OCD, or depression. Um, and if you think about that, that's a, that's a pretty big number. It's also one of the research findings that we've had recently is that it really is one of the most common complications of pregnancy. And we don't think of it like that because we think of complication as postpartum hemorrhage or mastitis or and there's such a stigma around perinatal mood disorders that we need to normalize it. We need to be able to talk about it in venues like this so that people can understand. You know, when we talk about intrusive thoughts, one of the things that I tell my moms is that they're just thoughts. You don't have any control over that. Just because you're thinking that thought doesn't mean that's what you're going to do to your child. Um, a lot of women get very frightened by that because they think, well, that means, like Jennifer said, I'm going crazy, but you're actually not going crazy. And it's actually a really positive thing if you can talk about it and talk about it to other women because that means you're concerned about it. When you have um, a more serious condition like postpartum psychosis, those women don't understand that those are intrusive thoughts. So the fact that you understand that they're scary thoughts is really a very positive part of this and and to kind of normalize it for moms and let them know that it's just a thought. It is just a thought. And I, I just wanted to sorry. <laughs> I just um, wanted to pipe in that um, we've talked about some anxiety and um, obviously depression, you know, if you're crying a lot and it's more than two weeks and it's not just the baby blues. Um, Evelyn, I'm going to interrupt there. Baby blues, would you say that's the first two weeks? That that's the first two weeks, and, you know, that could be just feeling a little weepy, um, but not beyond, two, beyond, you know, lasting for more than two weeks. And, and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, they can pop up while a mom is pregnant, 
and they can pop up any time in that first year or so after baby is born. So while many moms might immediately experience it, um, it might be a month or two or even more down the road before um, their symptoms really get to bad enough that somebody recognizes, hey, something is really wrong. I often have moms ask me, how do you tell whether it's postpartum blues or the um, baby blues or whether it's something more serious than that? And one of the one of the ways that I have people look at it <clears throat> is if it begins to interfere with your life, if it begins to interfere with your ability to take care of yourself, to take care of your child, to interact with your friends, to interact with your partner, then that's something that you need to talk to your provider about. Um, you know, <clears throat> we use the two week mark for um, baby blues. It's really kind of an arbitrary mark. It comes from the, um, the psychiatric DSM of being able to diagnose depression. You have to have symptoms for over two weeks. So that's where that two week comes from. Mm -hmm. But I often will tell women that if you're, if you're having trouble functioning, if you're having trouble really taking care of yourself, then that's when you need to talk to somebody. And I think you bring up a really good point about that self-care piece because especially if moms are not able to take care of themselves, they're not going to be able to tend to babies, they're not going to be able to tend to um, their husbands or, you know, to family and friends. And again, when we first become moms, we feel like we have this pressure to be super moms mm -hmm. and we've just got to let that go. Well, and as women, we're not really good at self-care anyway. Self-care is not something that we've learned a lot along the way and you're right when we become moms it's like all of a sudden our purpose is our children but really we need to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our children. Um, there was something you said earlier about the uh, psychosis portion of postpartum depression. I think that's what makes it such a difficult conversation for most people because I think that they they think that if I have postpartum depression that I automatically have the psychosis. And that's a, that's a great thing to be able to clarify. And Jennifer, you may be able to talk more about this too because I know you've done a lot of interviewing with other women. Um, but psychosis is really different from postpartum depression. Absolutely. Um, and psychosis um, is pretty rare. It's a medical emergency. Um, a lot of times it happens within the first week after delivery. Um, and, and it's a true psychosis. It's where you lose touch with reality. You lose touch with what's going on, what you're thinking, um, and you, you become, it, you just lose touch with reality. What, and, is the, what is the percentage of women that that affects? Like how, I mean, we know that doesn't happen often, but well, what is the statistic it, compared with how many moms are affected by postpartum depression? Well, we think that the studies that we've done and looking at the research, um, it's between 15 and 20 percent of all pregnancies are affected by some form of postpartum depression. About one percent of that will go on to have some type of a postpartum psychosis. So it's pretty rare. But I think that's what the media shows us, that's what we hear about, and that's what makes it very difficult for, I think, moms to have these real conversations, um, you know, because one of the things that I am just really honest with my families that I work with, and I tell this to my friends, I'm like, the first three months suck. Like, there's no, like, qualms about it. It is hard, you know, to get into the groove with a new baby. Your world has been rocked, and so I don't know that people always tell us that because, you know, we see these commercials and things that like this birth is so beautiful and um, and everything with baby is lovely and baby's sleeping everywhere and baby eats all the time and moms are having issues maybe with breastfeeding or sleeping and, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, they don't look so pretty because they're not doing their makeup every day and, you know, and it's I, not I, cracked up to be. What you and Evelyn do with the, with the childbirth education and with sleep training um, I know that Evelyn in her classes is really opening up the discussion around that it is hard, that it's, you know, and I think we we have painted pregnancy and labor and delivery um, as this wonderful rainbows and butterflies, and it can be that. 
Um, but there's also discomfort with it. There's also fear with it. There's also feeling overwhelmed. And I think it's really important that we talk to women about that and that normalizes it so that they worry about postpartum hemorrhage, you know, and so they keep a check on their bleeding and they keep a check on what they're doing. And so being able to understand that this is just a common complication um, and these are the these are the risk factors or these are the things to look for. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to pipe in while I go about another symptom. Talking, we talked about anxiety and depression, but we didn't really say too much about the OCD. Um, and that's another um, big symptom um, that moms that I meet with, come, you know, have, and it was something that I experienced. I could have, I could tell you how many diapers my daughter had had, whether they were wet, whether they were poopy. I could tell you how many minutes she had nursed on the left side and on the right side and when she was likely to fall asleep and when she fell asleep and how long she was going to sleep. And I, it just, you know, I became obsessed with everything that this baby did because it was I was trying to find some type of control. Um, and that really just overtook. And, you know, with some moms it's, you know, do they have enough diapers in the diaper bag set up, or have they checked all of the locks and and whatnot? Um, and so that's another a symptom that something might be a little off, and you might need help. And that was what my psychiatrist said contributed to my intrusive thoughts playing like a broken record in my head was the fact that I had OCD tendencies, which I had, which was one of my risk factors, mm -hmm. had prior to being pregnant. Um, you know, and, and I didn't say this earlier, but my other risk factor was my mother is bipolar. So I have mental health illnesses that run in my family history, and I've had bouts with depression before. And so those three things, you know, never really came up. And I think probably because I was, well, they should have asked, but it was never on probably paper because I was never medicated for it. It wasn't an OCD issue that I was medicated for. It wasn't medicated for depression, but there were still things that I had that my psychiatrist told me probably contributed to why this happened, you know, to me. And Irene, I wanted to mention because you said you said that um, how the media kind of paints this whole picture when we see the injury Yates's and you know these people that take their babies lives and things like that on the journey with this documentary film <laughs> we are when we ask people when you hear about postpartum depression what do you think of and it's amazing how people answer mm -hmm. because they truly are only being educated by the media yes. which unfortunately is not always the best place to get our information um, we're, we are making strides and making sure that the media reports things correctly, but we have a long way to go until that um, happens. But uh, yeah, they see the media and they automatically think, well, if I'm, and that's what I thought too, and I mentioned I felt like I was going crazy. Mm -hmm. Who else thinks about these things but somebody who must be losing their mind? Mm -hmm. And I automatically went, oh my gosh, I, I must be like that person in the media. And I think for someone who's not educated, because I wasn't being educated by any of the books I was reading or, you know, nurses or clinicians or whatever, you go to what you know, which was, well, I saw this in the media. At one point or another, this must be what's happening to me. And God. for a while, I thought I had psychosis. I mean, until I got into the field a little bit, um, I thought, oh, well, I had psychotic thoughts. So this must be psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so important, and I just want to repeat what Chris said, it really is that break with reality. But it's yeah. so important to know that a mother does not need to have psychosis to take her own life, because there are a lot of women that have taken their own life, but they were not having a psychotic moment. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a huge spectrum, and, and we're really hoping that our film kind of unblurs those lines a little bit to kind of really show what this is but that pregnancy is the catalyst for these things. So that remains the same. And, and while we don't want to put all these moms in the same basket, um, we kind of are. It's a spectrum. I mean, it's a whole gamut of things that have different symptoms. And sometimes these symptoms kind of overlap one another. I mean, I didn't think I was depressed, but after I started coming out of the intrusive thoughts, I got a little depressed. And so it kind of ran a gamut of different things and 
you know, education is power. I'm a huge believer that we need to just yeah. educate everybody, which is why what we're doing right now is is so, so important, and that's what I'm hoping the film does, and just opening up more of these units like they have in Chapel Hill. I mean, it's amazing, and I think that's what needs to happen for it to be normalized so that people do talk about this like they talk about gestational diabetes and all of these other things that happen with pregnancy. But we interviewed Andrew Yates' lawyer, George Parnum, who, by the way, is an amazing man, and he said it very well, and he said, mental health and motherhood just don't go together. Right. And people just can't put those things in the same place because that is supposed to be a beautiful thing, motherhood. And the fear and the mania of a mental illness with motherhood just doesn't go together. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for people to wrap their head around that. But it's something we need to do, or else we're going to keep losing moms and families are going to be torn apart. And I think it's something, Jennifer, you're right, that we need to talk about and we need to let people know that it is a common complication of pregnancy. You know, the prevalence of gestational diabetes is somewhere between 3.5 and 5 percent. The prevalence of perinatal mood disorder is 10 to 15 percent. We, we, we test everybody for gestational diabetes and because, we're, because moms want to know whether that's going on. Nobody wants to talk about perinatal mood disorders. I heard Patrick Kennedy speak um, several months ago and, and he talked about it as a brain dysfunction instead of a mental illness. And I think if we said you have a brain dysfunction, people would say, yes, I'll take care of it. What do I need to do? But when you say mental illness, there's such a stigma around that being in your head. Well, it is in your head. It's in your neurotransmitters. It's the chemicals that work through the connections in your head. So it's important for us to talk about it. Absolutely. I just, you know, this is such an important factor because I think that looking back on my journey, I'm pretty sure I had postpartum depression and I actually went and spoke with my OBGYN who was so open and spoke to me for an hour. And by the time I left, he was like, you're okay, you're dealing with just regular stress that a new mom is experiencing. But one of the things that I didn't realize was that, you know, I had a, a, a baby that was born early um, and was fine, and so I had a healthy baby, and I had no reasons to stress, but I was so super stressed out about that. I had a husband who was really sick, and I was taking care of him, and I was trying to arrange for child care, and just my life was turned upside down at that, at that point. But I think the fact that I continue to kind of reach out for help and then I realized, and I'm a big fan of therapy, I think it's really helpful for mm -hmm. everyone. Um, but I think that it's one of those things like I think I was able to work through it somehow or other. But I'm pretty sure that's why I'm a sleep coach now because I was holding my son back from sleeping because I was not able to do things that I needed to do to be well to take care of him. Mm -hmm. Great point. Those are really, really great points. And I think that it's um, anything that we can do to normalize it, anything that we can do to get women talking and to realize that it's it's not a scary thing. Um, mm -hmm. It's scary when you're going through it, but there's help. There's, there's people who are here to help talking about it. There's other mothers. There's support groups. Um, Postpartum Support International, I'm actually a board member also. And you know, that's part of our mission is to educate moms, but to make sure that moms know that there's support out there for them. Because it helps just to talk about it. I can't tell you how many moms have come into me and when I say, I know you're having intrusive thoughts and they're afraid to tell me about it because they're afraid you're going to call CPS or DSS to take my child away. And I said, no, that's not what I'm going to do. And then I say to them very calmly and very bluntly, you are not crazy. This is not crazy. And the tears just come because they're so afraid that that's exactly what's going on. Um, and th there is help there. There's help out there. And we're really, you know, with Jennifer's movie and with what you and Evelyn are doing, we're really trying to get the word out. Um, and it's such an important thing to talk about. Yeah. Well, so this is going to be one of many conversations that we're just starting. Um, Evelyn, if you would tell us about something coming up in June for everyone to know. Sure. So this June um, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 
Uh, the Postpartum Support International Annual Conference will be held at UNC. Um, that has a two-day conference on June the 20th and 21st. And that afternoon of Friday the 20th is open to the community. Um, if community members, whether it's moms or family members um, would like to attend, you can attend the afternoon sessions at a reduced rate. And we, um, the programming committee, um, which I sat on along with uh, Chris, uh, we picked out some great um, sessions that would, would appeal to um, the community. So things such as um, how, how these perinatal mood disorders affect the relationship with a mom and her partner, her spouse, um, and what how dads react and how dads can help. Um, things such as uh, how it how it goes hand in hand with breastfeeding and how that's all affected. So we would love to see moms and their family members come out for the community afternoon. Um, and as well, we would love to see doulas and childbirth educators and nurses and um, pediatricians and obstetricians and midwives, anybody that um, works with or comes in contact with expectant or new moms. There's also going to be a um, certificate training the two days prior to the conference of um, recognizing and um, perinatal mood disorders and how to help those moms get help. Great. It's going to be a great conference. Um, it's going to be a really good conference and I just wanted to I just wanted to emphasize that the community session on Friday um, is really is really going to be a wonderful thing for moms and the community to come to because you get in the in the price of that the reduced price you get the keynote um, which is Joy Burkhart, who um, has developed Healthy Moms 2020 and has uh, just a tremendous amount of information around community support. Um, and then they'll also get to go to all the sessions during that afternoon and the poster sessions in the evening. Um, so it's a it's going to be a really interesting. Um, it's the first time PSI has really. It's the first time that we've kind of partnered with NAMI the National Alliance of Mental Illness here in North Carolina. They're partnering with us to do that community afternoon piece. Um, and I really want to stress the training. The training, um, this is a training that PSI has done throughout the country. Um, and what we want to do here in North Carolina is be able to pull in as many people that we can to have that training so that we can increase our resource list so that when we have moms in all parts of this state, then we have people we can call on to help those moms. So it's a really important an opportunity for, for those of us here in North Carolina. Wonderful. Yes, Raleigh is a great place. There's lots of resources for moms that are here locally, um, but wherever moms are at, there are resources in your area, um, and I'm pretty sure any one of us could help you get connected with the correct resource. Yes. I'm I'm going to post a link below this video for the conference information so anyone can go ahead and check that out um, because, of course, moms matter and we're in this gentle fourth trimester. We're going to continue the conversation next week and continue talking about some more risk factors and actually putting together a postpartum support plan. So I wanted to go ahead and thank you, Chris and Evelyn and Jennifer. Uh, for being here and sharing this great information and being so open and honest about your story because it is about real moms just sharing their story. So we will see you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>